Good morning. The committee will come to order. I would like to begin this hearing by stating the Oversight Committee's mission statement. We exist to secure two fundamental principles. First, Americans have the right to know that the money Washington takes from them is well spent. And second, Americans deserve an efficient, effective government that works for them. Our duty on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee is to protect these rights. Our solemn, response, solemn responsibility is to hold government accountable to taxpayers because taxpayers have a right to know what they get from their government. We will work tirelessly in partnership with citizen watchdogs to deliver the facts to the American people and bring genuine reform to the Federal bureaucracy. This is the mission of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee. I would like to welcome everybody to this hearing. It is entitled Status Report on the Transition to a Civilian-Led Mission in Iraq. I would like to, rec uh, like to welcome Ranking Member Tierney and other members of the subcommittee and members of the audience uh, for their participation and, and attendance here today. Today's proceedings continue the subcommittee's effort to examine the challenges facing, facing the Defense Department and the State Department as they transition from a military-led to a civilian-led effort in Iraq. This is the subcommittee's second hearing on this matter. On November 17, 2008, the Bush administration and the government of Iraq signed a Status of Forces Agreement which set a December 31, 2011 deadline for the departure of all U.S. military forces from Iraq. To date, the, to date, the Defense Department has redeployed thousands of troops and dramatically reduced its footprint. From all outward, appearance, all outward appearances, the Defense Department seems to be hitting its benchmarks. As they draw down, the State Department is increasing its footprint. To fill the void left by the Defense Department, the State Department will hire thousands of private contractors to complete the mission. In all, the State Department's footprint will balloon to approximately 17,000 personnel. And according to the Government Accountability Office, the GAO, nearly 14,000 will be private contractors. These contractors will perform a wide range of tasks, including life support services and logistics. They will also recover downed aircraft and personnel, dispose of ordnance and transport, transport personnel. State Department will also hire a private army of nearly 7,500 security contractors to do everything from guarding the walls and gates to guarding VIP convoys and flying UAVs. But while they will have the ability of sense and warn of incoming ordnance, they will not have the ability to shoot it down. I find this puzzling. I would like to discuss this further. So as the Defense Department winds down, the State Department is ramping up in what may be more of a political shell game than a drawdown of forces. When President Obama tells the American people that forces will be out of Iraq, I am not sure the average American understands that the troops will be replaced with a private army of security contractors. Nevertheless, the State Department faces a daunting and unprecedented challenge. Many have expressed doubts as to whether the State Department will meet the December 31st deadline and whether it can oversee the administration's surge in private contracting. According to the GAO, the State Department, quote, has acknowledged that it does not have the capacity to independently acquire and oversee the scale and nature of contracted services needed, end quote. The Commission on Wartime Contracting has also expressed tremendous concern. Last July, it wrote that despite interdepartmental efforts, quote, the current planning for the defense to state transition of vital functions in Iraq is not yet adequate, end quote. On March, March 1st, Commissioners Grant Green and Michael Tebow testified before this subcommittee. When asked whether the State Department is ready, they answered no. They explained that it has neither the funds to pay nor the resources to manage the thousands of additional contractor employees. Last week, six of the eight commissioners testified before the full committee about billions of waste, fraud, and abuse in contracting, something in the range of $30 to $60 billion. They warned that the State Department is struggling to prepare, to prepare requirements for contractors and effectively oversee them. In other words, it appears the State Department has not made enough progress to ensure a smooth transition. And I hope that has a different message to convey this morning. A commitment from Ambassador Kennedy that the State Department will be fully capable on January 1st would be a great start. On a related matter, I would appreciate if the Defense Department would clear up some confusion surrounding its drawdown. There have been numerous reports that President Obama may order thousands of combat troops to remain in Iraq at the Iraq government's request to conduct training of Iraqi military. While I understand negotiations are ongoing with the Iraqi government, I believe the American people have the right to additional clarity on how many troops will remain and what their mission and legal status will be. The, the Iraqi government has said that it will strip away any U.S. troops that remain next year of the limited legal immunity that they currently enjoy. No one here wants to see brave American soldiers prosecuted in Iraqi courts for defending themselves from insurgent attacks. 
Our troops should have the same legal protections on January 1st as they did on December 31st, and it is the President's obligation to see that they do. In only two and a half months, the administration must work quickly to get this done. We have a distinguished panel here today who has been very involved in this, and I appreciate each of the gentlemen for joining us here today. And I look forward to hearing from this panel of witnesses. I now like to recognize the distinguished ranking member, the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Tierney, for his opening statement. Thank you. You know, our uh, current military operation in Iraq, Operation Iraq of Freedom, as we all know, began on March 20, 2003, when President Bush ordered the invasion of Iraq. I can remember, as many of you probably do, watching it on television and seeing it went. I watched with great trepidation uh, based on the weaknesses of the administration's case for striking in the first place. But since then, our brave men and women in uniform have fought hard to help return the country to civilian rule. After heroic sacrifice of over eight years that cost over 4,000 American lives and nearly $1 trillion, the men and women of our armed forces can leave Iraq with their heads held high. Not so sure about those policymakers who made the decision to put their lives and America's treasure uh, at risk. We are now ready to enter the next stage of our efforts in Iraq. In 2008, the Bush administration agreed to withdraw all U.S. troops from Iraq by the end of 2011. The Obama administration has tried to stick to that agreement and indicates that it is on track to meet that deadline. I think that is what we are going to explore here today. The State Department has been charged with the responsibility for supporting the stability and development of Iraq once the military has left. Now the task is to make sure that our military's efforts are not squandered and that Iraq's fragile stability is not lost. Let me be clear. I strongly support the drawdown of military forces in Iraq and the transition to a civilian-led mission. And I understand the extraordinary burden that this will put on the State Department, particularly since some who seem to be complaining most about the transition and whether or not it will work are the ones that voted against reducing the State Department's budget, which is sort of a contradiction in, uh, in, in the situation. Our role today should not be to blame the State Department for the military to civilian transition that has been in process for three years and is required by a bilateral agreement with the sovereign nation of Iraq. Rather, our committee's role should be to press for greater management and oversight of the resources that State will be deploying in the name of the United States. This is our third hearing on the topic in the last year under both the Democrat and Republican majorities in the House. And by most accounts, State has made important progress and is now ready to assume the mission. I want to acknowledge State for its hard work in preparing for the transition. Still, today I would like to address one ongoing concern that I have about the continuing use of private contractors in war zones. Just last week, the full committee held a hearing on the Commission on Wartime Contracting's final report to Congress. At that hearing, the Commission raised significant concerns about the future role of private security contractors who will be employed by the State Department after the military leaves Iraq. At the hearing, Commissioner Robert Henke highlighted a recently adopted Office of Management and Budget Policy memo that for the first time addresses the proper role of security contractors in combat zones. The policy memo embraced a risk-based analysis to determine what functions are inherently governmental and what functions can properly be delegated to a contractor. It is an important step in the right direction. The memo continues by defining specific examples of inherently governmental functions that should never be performed by a private contractor. Notably, it found, and I quote, security operations performed in environments where, in the judgment of the responsible Federal official, there is significant potential for the security operations to evolve into combat, close quote, should be considered an inherently governmental function. So I would like to hear from our witnesses today, and specifically Ambassador Kennedy, about the intended role of security contractors in Iraq after the transition. And I would like you to specifically address the OMB's guidance that was cited by Commissioner Henke. In his written statement today, Ambassador Kennedy said that the Department of State will employ approximately 5,000 private security contract employees in Iraq. I agree with his assessment this is a significant number. But beyond the number of security contractors that will be employed in Iraq, I am concerned about the specific functions these contractors will be expected to perform. For example, I understand the Department will employ a number of contractors who will be responsible for rapid response to security situations in the field, in addition to the stationary security forces who will be responsible for protecting the Embassy. These rapid response forces will be responsible for emergency response, including securing State Department employees in the case of an attack. To my mind, this situation would almost certainly require the private security contractors to engage in combat. I think any reasonable person would see that to be a direct conflict with the OMB policy memo, 
and therefore an improper use of private security contractors under that guidance. Ambassador Kennedy, I look forward to hearing how the Department plans to deal with this issue and others. And I want to thank all of our witnesses again once, uh, once more for showing your interest here today. I yield back. Thank you. Uh, members will have seven days to submit their opening <coughs> statements for the record. Uh, now I would like to introduce our, our distinguished panel. We have Ambassador Patrick Kennedy, who is the Under Secretary for Management at the Department of State. Ambassador Alexander Vershbo is the Assistant Secretary for International Security Affairs at the Department of Defense. And Mr. Alan Estevez is the Assistant Secretary for Logistics and Material Readiness at the Department of Defense. Pursuant to committee rules, all witnesses will be sworn in before they testify. Please rise and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Let the record reflect that the witness is answered in the affirmative. Uh, in order to allow time for the discussion, please try to limit your opening testimony to five minutes, but we will be fairly generous with those five minutes. It is also my understanding that the Department of Defense will issue a joint verbal statement uh, that will be given by Mr. Estevez. I would like to start with Ambassador Kennedy. You are now recognized for five minutes or a little bit more if you need it. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Turney. Thank you for inviting me to update the State Department's progress in transitioning from a military-led to a civilian-led presence in Iraq from DOD's mission to State's mission. I ask that, that, you, that I can submit my full testimony for the record. So ordered. Continued U.S. engagement with Iraq is essential. A stable and self-reliant Iraq is profoundly in the national security interests of the United States. Our diplomatic presence is designed to maximize influence in key locations. Erbil and Kirkuk in the north, Baghdad in the center, Basra in the south. State will continue the police development program, moving beyond basic policing skills to provide police forces with the capabilities to uphold the rule of law. The Office of Security Cooperation will help close gaps in Iraqi security forces' capabilities through security assistance and cooperation. Turning now to our safe and secure management platforms, we have made much progress since March when I discussed eight key components to launching these platforms in Iraq. My written testimony details our progress in each area. I will focus here on contract oversight and security. But first, with regard to our entire support platform, we are not struggling to award contracts. We have competitively awarded all contracts for facility construction fit-out, for uh, security and aviation support, to stand up three diplomatic support hospitals and for life support. We are mindful of recent reports, such as that by the Commission on Wartime Contracting regarding waste. We understand the extraordinarily difficult budget environment and have carefully assured prudent use of our funding. We have continued to work with DOD very closely every day at unprecedented levels. The Joint DOD Equipping Board has identified more than 3,200 pieces of equipment worth approximately $224 million to be transferred as excess, sold, or loaned to State. In the area of contracting and contracting oversight, throughout our efforts, State is always cognizant of inherently governmental functions. We contract for services that are not inherently governmental. State personnel were actively engaged with the Office of Federal Procurement Policy in preparing its new policy letter. We continue to focus on effective transition contracting deploying experienced contracting personnel. State can surge resources to address specific contingency needs through an internal funding mechanism, which is a 1 percent fee charged on all contracting services. We have hired 102 additional contracting staff and support staff over the past several years and made improvements in the area of suspension and debarment, increased competition, and enhanced training. In the area of security, Task orders for static and movement security have been competitively awarded for all State sites in Iraq on the basis of best value. In the past few years, State's Diplomatic Security Service has expanded its plan for oversight and operational control of private security contractor personnel. It will have more than 175 direct hire State Department personnel to administer the contract and its task orders in Iraq ensuring contract compliance by approximately 5,000 security contract employees. These 5,000, who will cover all of our sites in Iraq to protect U.S. government staff, 
reflect State's continuous operation in locations where previously we would have not been able to operate. Guard forces in Iraq are like other local guards, serving as the first line of our defense for our facilities and staff. They differ, however, from our typical guard force in that they have higher recruiting, screening and training requirements, a higher percentage of American and third country national personnel, and specialized weapons and equipment which are necessary to defend our personnel and facilities from attack. In contingency areas such as Iraq and Afghanistan, our security contractors are under the direct management and oversight of State Department Diplomatic Security Service direct hire personnel. Their function was illustrated last September 13 during the terrorist incident in Kabul, where the embassy security elements acted swiftly to protect embassy staff and Afghan visitors, moved them to safe locations, took defensive actions as directed by the Chief of Mission, and acted in concert with host nation security forces. We are staffed to achieve the operational measures and increase direct oversight to ensure professionalism and responsibility of security contractor personnel. Diplomatic security personnel at each post in Iraq and Afghanistan serve as managers for these security programs. They provide direct operational oversight of all protected motorcades in Iraq and Afghanistan. This is done for each and every one. We fully realize that the scope of our diplomatic activities in Iraq are beyond anything that we have done in the past. However, State has a history of embracing challenges. We have the confidence in the personnel to mobilize in Iraq, and we have DOD's full partnership at every level, from Secretary Panetta and Chairman Dempsey to the excess property clerks on the ground. With the teams in place, our executive steering group, our Baghdad team, joint State DOD teams, and State's Iraq transition coordinator. We will deliver on this new State Department mission because it is in the U.S. national interest that we do so. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for inviting me and for your continued support and that of Ranking Member Turney for the Department of State. I will welcome any questions you may have. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I appreciate it. And I will recognize Mr. Estevez for five minutes. Chairman Chavitz, uh, Ranking Member Tierney, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. We have a written statement to include in the record that provides a more general overview of the situation in Iraq. However, in the interest of time, I would like to summarize the progress that the Department of Defense has made as it supports the Department of State during the transition to civilian control in Iraq. The Department of Defense remains fully engaged in support of Operation New Dawn and is committed to a smooth transition to the Department of State in support of the enduring diplomatic and security assistance missions in the region. We are in execution phase of this transition and are on track and in some cases are ahead of schedule with all the logistics functions associated with the drawdown of forces and support to the Department of State. Both the Department of Defense and the Department of State are committed to working together to achieve a successful transition. Although the Under Secretary of Defense for Acquisition, Technology and Logistics is not responsible for establishing policy in this area, we are responsible for many of the details associated with the transition including contracting support, maintenance and supply support, and other logistics components of the transition. As the Principal Deputy Undersecretary of Defense Acquisition Technology and Logistics testified on March 2, 2011, we have established a temporary senior executive steering group focused on coordinating and synchronizing the material and support aspects of the transition. Our combined Office of Secretary of Defense Joint Staff Equipping Board has addressed the individual equipment items that the Department of State has requested, which range from medical equipment to counter-rocket protection. As Ambassador Kennedy noted, to date we have identified more than 3,200 end items that are being transferred, sold, or loaned to the Department of State. These items represent 100 percent fulfillment of the Department of State's request for equipment support. In addition to 60 Cayman Plus mine-resistant ambush-protected vehicles, that were approved for loan at the time of the last testimony. The Department of Defense has since agreed to loan the Department of State two giraffe kind of rocket systems and a suite of 164 biometric collection and identification systems. As of October 1, 2011, our force numbers are down to roughly 43,500. The contractor population also continues to decrease as the number of military personnel they support diminishes. We have also made steady progress in executing the plan to retrograde and redistribute equipment. Over the last year in Iraq, Joint Department of Defense and Department of State teams have executed well-coordinated plans that have synchronized the handoff of responsibilities 
to the Department of State at those locations where the Department of State will be the lead agency. The transition of these sites is not a turnkey operation, and each site presents its own unique set of challenges. As we resize these sites to fit the diplomatic mission, new perimeters continue to be established, containerized housing units are moved in accordance with mission requirements, utilities are being rerouted, and as required, additional site preparation and force protection materials are being installed. The Department of Defense is also providing a number of specific functions on a reimbursable basis under the authority of the Economy Act. The Log Cap 4 task order was awarded to provide the Department of State with base life support and core logistics services. This contracting mechanism is scalable and can respond to changing conditions on the ground. Food distribution, as well as fuel supply and disposition services, will continue to be provided by the Defense Logistics Agency. The Army Sustainment Command recently modified its contract for maintenance of select equipment and is providing contract services for static and movement security. The Defense Contract Management Agency and the Defense Contract Audit Agency will continue to provide administrative contract support and oversight. Again, the Department of State will reimburse the Department of Defense for all contracts and service support provided. In closing, let me reassure you that the Department of Defense is proactively partnering with the Department of State, is fully engaged in executing the drawdown of U.S. military forces and equipment in Iraq, and remains agile enough to respond to any potential changes in these requirements. Thank you for your time and look forward to your questions. Thank you. And I assure you that your full uh, written statements will be entered into the record uh, unless there is any objection. Without objection, it was so ordered. Um, I would now like to recognize myself for, for five minutes. And uh, Mr. Ambassador Vershbaugh, I would li like to start with you. Um, McClatchy newspapers, uh, in an article coming out, uh, came out yesterday in the Philadelphia Inquirer, uh, was, uh, the headline is, U.S. military trainers can stay, leader says. Um, it, but I am troubled by what President uh, uh, Talibani said, quote, we have agreed to retain more than 5,000 American trainers without giving them immunity. We have sent them our agreement to retain this number and are awaiting their response, yes or no, end quote. I find it deeply troubling that, uh, that there is the prospect of our troops being in, in Iraq without immunity. I, I think this is totally unacceptable. Can you please give us an update on the situation? Yes, Mr. Chairman, I would be, be happy to, uh, to respond. Uh, indeed, there are some important issues raised by that article. First of all, uh, Iraq's political leadership has indicated that they are interested in a training relationship uh, with the United States after 2011. And uh, we very much want to have an enduring partnership with the Iraqi government uh, and people and a relationship with the Iraqi security forces would be a very important part of that relationship. Uh, I think, as you know, we have long been planning to have the uh, Office of Security Cooperation Iraq, OSCI, uh, which would be under Chief of Mission Authority, uh, serve as the cornerstone of a strategic security partnership, and it would be the hub for uh, a range of security assistance and security uh, uh, cooperation activities. So that, of course, uh, is the baseline. Uh, we have been reviewing the official statement issued by Iraqi leaders on training assistance uh, on October the 4th and discussing with them how this fits into the principle of security cooperation under the 2008 Strategic Framework Agreement. Uh, I should add that we appreciate the, the democratic spirit displayed by Iraqi leaders in debating this important subject. Uh, and, we'll, and we will continue discussions uh, with our Iraqi counterparts in the days ahead. So these negotiations are ongoing, and it is uh, premature to discuss what any potential well, training we'll, relationship we'll, might look like. Well, will our but, troops have immunity, yes or no? Yeah, I will get to that issue, Mr. Chairman. Uh, but as we work to define the parameters of what, what it will look like, uh, uh, the issues uh, raised yet again in this article regarding the status protections, of course, will be an important issue. Uh, again, I don't want to get into the specifics of the negotiations, but we will always ensure that our forces have the appropriate protections uh, that they need when they are deployed overseas. Uh, there is a number of different uh, When you say appropriate protections, is that, is that immunity? 
I think there is different uh, terminology implied. Yeah, that is yeah. why I am seeking a little clarification <laughs> here. I am not feeling too comfortable at the moment. Will our troops have immunity? They will, we, they will have the status protections, which has been defined under the strategic framework, uh, under the strate security agreement, excuse me, uh, the, the status of forces agreement that now applies as uh, indicating that our forces would be subject to U.S. law rather than Iraqi law. So we will be looking for something going forward that provides the comparable level of protection. Exactly how that will be achieved, uh, again, is a subject of ongoing negotiations. Some of the personnel, as I mentioned, under the OSCI will be covered under Chief of Mission Authority. The, the question that is still being discussed is whether any additional personnel would be involved and how they would, uh, how they would uh, be, be protected. We certainly take very seriously the concerns you have expressed. Uh, let me move on. I, I think this is a major, major point of concern. Uh, it is obviously a, a major point of difference and something that obviously must be resolved. I and mean, it is totally unacceptable to think that our troops would be there uh, without immunity as they have uh, they've enjoyed currently. Uh, uh, Ambassador Kennedy, let me go back to these loss functionalities. Last time we gathered together, uh, we referred to this July 12, 2010 Commission on Wartime Contracting Special Report. It talked about the, last, the lost functionalities. This was on page 4 of that report. There were 14 specific um, security-related tasks now performed by Department of Defense that State must provide as the military draws down. I know there had been progress on at least seven of those, but could you give me an update as to, of those 14 specific ones, what are you not prepared to take care of? Um, Mr. Chairman, if you can hit the, sorry, hit the thing. My apologies. Mr. Chairman, as we outlined in my, uh, in my June 8th letter to, uh, to the committee, uh, we believe that we have covered the functions that are absolutely essential to our to our operations there, we will have the ability through the. Uh, through Would that be all 14 of these? I think I think you can say we will have the uh, ability to do everything for except for example the recovery of downed aircraft. Should an aircraft go down, we will be able to move to recover the personnel from those aircraft. But whether we will, because we don't have quite the heavy lift of the Department of Defense, we not, may not be able to recover, recover the airframe itself. So of the 14, that's the only one that you are concerned about? Well, I, I am concerned about everything possibly going wrong. Right, right. I, mean, I, cannot, I cannot. But functionality. But functionality, um, going, if I could, Mr. Chairman, to your sure. earlier in your opening statement, you ask about uh, counter-battery neutralization. Mm -hmm. We will have the, um, the ability, thanks to uh, my colleagues in the Defense Department, with, with a system that is called Giraffe, which is an early, an early warning system that tracks incoming uh, rockets or, uh, or mortars, gives us sufficient warning to deal with that, with, that we will be able to sound the alarm. And in the construction activities that we have, are undertaking at all the sites that our personnel will both work and live, we are constructing overhead cover that means should one of the, uh, those missiles or, or mortars strike one of our facilities, and this has happened in Baghdad and the construction techniques we have been using in Baghdad have proven very, very effective, there is no penetration of the building itself. The, uh, the but can we, can we or will we fire back? We will not, no, sir, the State Department will, has no howitzers and no counter rockets fired. We will not fire back. That is not a diplomatic activity. We are now have a diplomatic mission in Iraq, not a military mission. But if I might add, we are partnered extensively with the Iraqi military and the Iraqi police who have been assisting us during the last few months. We have been without such a counter-battery uh, counter fire uh, ability, and the Iraqi police and the Iraqi military have been great assistance of disrupting uh, the attempts of, of uh, forces to attack our, uh, our uh, facilities via rockets and mortars. Well, God bless the men and women who are going to continue to be there, because if it is the policy of the United States not to fire back, I, I, have, I have deep concerns. We will we'll continue to discuss this. I have been very generous with my time. I now recognize the uh, gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Tierney. Thank you. Uh, Ambassador Kennedy, will you uh, describe or compare for me what a, a normal uh, State Department deployment to any particular country would be 
and how that stacks up against what you are going to be doing in Iraq. So take a non-conflict area and talk about size of operation for a comparably sized and populated country and how the missions are going to uh, vary. I, I think, uh, Mr. Tierney, that in terms of the personnel deployed uh, to do, I will call it, substantive and basic administrative and logistic work, our, our embassy and consulates in, in Iraq will be, would be comparable to a, to a similar country. What is different in Iraq is the additional layers of security, medical, and life support that we have to provide there because our people cannot go shopping on the outside. There is an active and ongoing threat to life and limb. So we have taken a package that it is necessary to conduct the State Department's mission. There is obviously a police training component, which does not exist in, in every country. And then we have added security, medical, logistics, and life support that is appropriate for the situation on the ground in Iraq. But we very much believe, and we think we are seeing evidence, that that supplement, so to speak, will be able to withdra be withdrawn measure by measure over time as the security situation further stabilizes and as we are able to obtain more goods and services on the local economy. How many uh, locations or locales will State Department diplomatic personnel be located at? Uh, at four, Mr. Tierney. Uh, uh, widely uh, disseminated around the country or closely knit? Or? Uh, they will be in the north at, in Erbil, where we have two closely linked sites, in Baghdad, where we have our, our embassy, uh, two other compounds literally right across the street, a police training compound on the other side of the river, and a, uh, and a logistics hub at, uh, at Baghdad Airport. We will have a small uh, consular presence co-located with the Office of Security Cooperation in Kirkuk, and then we will have a consulate general in Basra in the south, sir. Okay. And there will be convoys, I assume, going from one to the other from time to time? Uh, they, would, they will be supply convoys. Our plan is to conduct those movements uh, via air. All of it to be here. Uh, except, obviously, except the ones across the street, and and the road to the airport is very often uh, is very often safe, so we would be able to. But we we have an aviation capability, thanks to the uh, Congress's assistance, that will enable us to move personnel via either fixed wing, in from Amman or Kuwait, and the long distances Baghdad up to Erbil, Baghdad down down south to Basra, and then we have. Uh, distributed helicopter rotary wing capability in order to move, move our personnel, should it be required, between, between near, nearly placed locations. You are essentially going to have no ground convoy security issues? Uh, well, obviously, there are, there are some movements uh, within, within Baghdad or in, in, in outside of the compound in Basra where, yes, there will be security issues, which is why we have turned to our colleagues in the Department of Defense and they have been uh, providing us on loan with uh, mine-resistant uh, uh, transport vehicles, sir. Who is going to provide the security, the human security, for those convoys? That, that security will be provided by contractor personnel, but each one of those con movements with contract security personnel, each and every one of those will have a State Department diplomatic security officer in the convoy who is the agent in charge using, using security parlance. He or she is in charge. They give the orders. The contractors only respond to the orders given by the diplomatic security Federal employee. Has there been any thought given to taking uh, State personnel from other locations around the world and locating them in this conflict likely area and instead using the contractors elsewhere? We have, that, we have analyzed that, sir. I have a grand total of 1,800 diplomatic security special agents oh. and about another 100 uh, security professionals in my entire uh, staff. I, if I would have to strip the entire world, mm -hmm. and given what we all know to be the threats against United States interests around the world, plus my 
requirement to protect the Secretary of State, distinguish foreign visitors to the United States, and enforce the passport and visa laws of the United States. I simply do not have it. I have stripped to 175 to make sure that I have professionals overseeing the contracts as a whole, and then a State Department direct hire professional in each one of those convoys. Now, the Secretary of State has written members of Congress indicating a concern for proposed reductions in the State Department's budget. Um, if those deduction, reductions are uh, enforced, will that impact your ability to hire and train additional people to perform that function? It, it will, sir. Uh, we, we know that, uh, that, that we have this mission. We have been, I think, as judicious as possible, as streamlined as possible, borrowing and receiving transfers of equipment from the Department of Defense. <clears throat> but if the President's budget request is not enacted, we will have a severe difficulty maintaining our task presence there in Iraq and in Afghanistan and Pakistan and worldwide, for that matter, sir. I will yield back for now and there will be another round, I assume. Thank you. Um, uh, going back, Ambassador Vershpo, let's talk about the number of U.S. troops. What uh, the Iraqis are requesting or authorizing? How many is the President authorizing? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, no decisions have been made. Uh, discussions are still ongoing uh, on the nature of the relationship, uh, which from which would be derived any any. Uh, so the number, number of three to four thousand troops that we hear is that accurate or inaccurate? Uh, as I said, there is a lot of things going on in these discussions which predate the announcement of October 4 when the Iraqi leaders took the position that they have taken regarding uh, no immunities. So uh, obviously the discussions uh, now have, have taken on a different dimension. Uh, so beyond, beyond that, I really can't say because nothing has been decided. The shape of the relationship will be determined in part by how this issue of status protections is, is addressed. So it is a work in progress. Even as we speak, discussions are taking place between uh, our ambassador, uh, the commander, uh, General Austin, and Iraqi leaders. So it is really difficult to give you more than that today. Now, the re there was a report that General Austin had asked re for between 14 and 18,000 troops. Is that true? Again, I, I, I can't comment on internal deliberations. A lot of different ideas have been wait a second, bounced wait a around in the, in the course of the last few months. Do you know what the actual request was? Uh, the, the military leadership was asked to provide a range of options, and they have done that, and uh, that was the basis on which we engaged the Iraqis, and now the, the discussions have Do you know uh, what General Austin requested? I can't talk about that in an open session, Mr. Chairman. It is uh, classified. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, when do we have to make this decision? I mean, I guess it is the end of the year, right? Is there, a, is there a particular timetable to this? Well, there is no, no absolute deadline. And right now we are on the trajectory that was established by the uh, agreement by the previous administration in November of 2008 to draw down uh, all of our forces, uh, which are now around 43,000. And then move in 2012 to the Office of Security Cooperation in Iraq, which would have 157 U.S. military and DOD civilian personnel, and uh, additional security assistant team contractors uh, supporting specific FMS cases. The discussions that are going on now relate to what potential additions to that presence would be uh, agreed. Uh, whether that would, would be before or after the end of the year remains to be seen. But obviously the discussions are ongoing. Uh, it might be simpler to reach the agreement before all of our forces have left, but uh, we are talking about an entirely different relationship in either case. And uh, all right, thank you. again, I cannot predict when uh, these dis okay. discussions will close. Uh, uh, Ambassador Kennedy, let's say about these uh, hiring up of all of these uh, contractors. When we get to January 1st, based on where we are at here in October, what, where are we going to be on the staffing levels? Are we, are we set to hit 100 percent of the goal? Is it, if you can clarify that a little bit for me. And I, there are obviously different categories. The security is maybe a little bit more important, but food service is going to be equally as important. So where are we on that spectrum of, of being able to accomplish that goal? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We have awarded contracts for all the services that we require 
uh, in, a, in Iraq at all the installations. And those contracts, task orders, have been awarded. The contractors are in the process of mobilizing. The medical contractor, for example, is already, is already mobilized. The aviation contractor is, is already mobilized. The life support contract has been awarded, thanks to my colleagues at the Department of Defense, awarded on our behalf and a contract that we will fund. That contractor is mobilizing, and it is, is in fact, a contractor the DOD has been using at all the sites that we will be engaged in except two, and that is all well on the way. We believe that we will have no problem in those support services areas okay. being fully staffed, fully supportive of our personnel before uh, December 31st. Thank you. Uh, we talked about the hospital. You mentioned the, the hospital or medical needs. Uh, there has been some concern that, that there won't be the capacity to deal with a mass, mass casualty event, um, that the, uh, the uh, medical facility at the Baghdad International Airport will have the capability only to handle set six patients overnight. Do you have any concerns of that? Uh, Mr. Chairman, yes, I do have a concern, but I also have to operate in the realm of reality. We, have, we do also have a medical unit at the, at the American Embassy uh, compound downtown. It is not a hospital unit staffed with surgeons as the one. We also, though, sir, because of our aviation capabilities, have the capability of quickly transporting uh, personnel who have been stabilized but need further surgery to locations such as Jordan, Kuwait, Turkey, or all the way to Europe should it be required. So we believe we have put in, into place a layered system that would be able to, uh, to deal with uh, what we foresee as, uh, as the facts on the ground. Thank you. I will now uh, recognize uh, Mr. Tierney. Thank you. Uh Ambassador Kennedy, the protection for the logistical contractors uh, and various functions that they are doing, whether it be kitchen help or uh, people over at the police training area, stuff like that, is that also going to be provided by private contractors? Yes, sir. That, that is within the number of uh, 5,000, which is approximately 3,500 static perimeter guards around, uh, around our facilities and 1,500 uh, movement personnel. Will they be getting a similar type of State employee? Uh, or security personnel supervision? Yeah. Yes, sir. The Diplomatic Security Service will control both the static guards and the movement guards. Who specifically is going to be training the uh, police on that and, and under which program? That is under the uh, Bureau of International Narcotics and Law Enforcement uh, Police Training Program under Assistant Secretary Brownfield's leadership. So it is a combination of State personnel it's and uh, go ahead. No, please. It is a combination of, of State Department personnel and some, and some contract trainers for some activities. Has there been any consideration to doing uh, out-of-country training of these police personnel? Uh, there has been some consideration of that. I will have to get back to you, sir, with more details. Uh, what we are trying to do is, is do a large number of people with sort of second echelon. Uh, the Bureau of Narcotics and Law Enforcement and my DOD colleagues have done a great job in training the, the, the police on the beat. This training is, in effect, advanced training, and we believe that, we, at, that the, one of the most important locations to do that is at the, at the Baghdad Police College, which adjoins uh, one, the, uh, the uh, training center. Uh, that I mentioned. If you have done an Baghdad. analysis about the benefits or possible benefits of out-of-country training of that nature by the United States personnel or by a combination of international personnel, I would like to see it, if you could. I will have to, I'll ask uh, Assistant Secretary Brownfield to get that to you, sir. So who has been vetting and training the private contractors that are going to be providing security? Uh, State Department Diplomatic Security Service runs background investigations on every single one of these individuals. They are given Sir, what are called public trust clearances, which is the equivalent to a secret security clearance, although they do not have the need to know. But it's the same rubric: police checks, national agency checks, interviews, vetting, uh, 
records checks. So we, we feel very, very comfortable that the individuals we are engaging to do this security work are of the highest standard. The Wartime Contracting Commission uh, basically indicated they thought that there should be consideration given to the operational, the political, and the financial uh, aspects or risks of contracting functions uh, on that. I am assuming that you were precluded from doing that because of the limitations you had in personnel. You simply had to spread your people thin to manage and supervise the contractors and really didn't uh, have the opportunity to, to weigh in on those other factors of risk. Well, well sir, um, there are two parts to that. I mean, obviously, there is uh, personnel and resources. I only have 1,800, as I mentioned. But I try to take a holistic approach. What I see are requirements in both Iraq and Afghanistan, if I might add that. This is a surge. This is not a permanent requirement that I see the Bureau of Diplomatic Security having to rise to adding 5,000 additional personnel in for the long haul, the number we will have in, uh, in Iraq. I see this as a surge. The State Department, other government agencies, have always dealt with surge requirements by turning to contractors. To hire someone, to promise them a 20 or 25 or 30 year career when we don't see the need for their services out beyond three to five years, just citing that as a factor, would saddle the State Department and the American taxpayer with a number a level of personnel that is not in the best interest. Well, that, that would be one of the considerations I assume that they would want to measure. The other, of course, would be the potential of uh, non-State Department or non-Defense Department people uh, performing an act or taking on some activity that totally puts the country at risk or uh, makes some political situation untenable. That is entirely possible, sir. But that is why, though, all of our personnel, whether they are static or movement, act under the direct supervision of diplomatic security special agents or security protective officers who are all direct hire. What uh, contingency plan does the State Department have if uh, facts on the ground change substantially enough that it is no longer feasible to have private security contractors in use? I think that uh, and that is an option that I have thought about. I can't speak to my colleagues. I think, though, that I would have to report to the Secretary that we would have to severely scale down our operations in Iraq. Uh, I have even done an analysis based upon an old uh, uh, General Accountability Office study on the number of Federal law enforcement personnel in the entire Federal service. And even if I took 10 percent of the Bureau of Prison Guards, I would not have enough static, static officers there, and the Bureau of, Prison Guard, Bureau of Prisons might have some comment on that. So I believe that these these professionals that we engage, that we vet, that we, we write the syllabus for their training, we spot check their training, we direct their performance hands on, eyes on, I believe that that is the way that right. it, but we the, should go. The plan is, if, if it becomes untenable, then be there is to scale down operations as opposed to just keep hiring more and more contractors. Well, if I, I, I'm sorry. I apologize. I thought the predicate. Assuming things on the ground change, it becomes so uh, violent over oh, there. Oh, so I'm sorry. I thought you meant that I could no longer keep contractors there for some. Right. Other and that's my point. Is that you know, no. it becomes well, at a point where the contractors aren't feasible to operate. When you've made the uh, analysis on that, it's it, not to like just keep loading them in, hoping that things are going to change. It's to scale down operations. I think. I think we have in our plan sufficient contractors to provide to provide perimeter know, security and cooperation with the Iraqi police and military. I, I know you do. But contingency plans are for when that doesn't work. And then I think I heard you say that the, you would recommend the Secretary scaled back. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. I yield back. Uh, uh, Mr. Estevez, uh, do you have a uh, dollar figure or estimate of what assets will be either turned over to the Iraqis or left behind? It's your microphone, please. The microphone. Button. Sorry. I apologize, Mr. Chairman. Uh, there's a couple of different programs that we have for turning things over to the Iraqis, uh, including foreign military sales. So they are buying military equipment from us, which is not left behind. That is basically new equipment, though there are some things that they have purchased from what, us. What is the value? Of, how much uh, um, have they purchased? Well, I am trying to give you a couple of different programs here. So under what we call foreign excess property, 
That is uh, $320 million, $321 million to date. That will go up as we continue over the next three months to draw down. Uh, and that is where the Iraqi government pays the U.S. Uh, that is we give it to them. Do we just that is because the cost-benefit analysis is we don't need this stuff. It includes T-wall barriers and generators that don't work in the United States and vehicles that aren't up to U.S. Uh, vehicle code. Uh, and the cost-benefit analysis says we saved $600 million in not transporting that equipment back to the United States, where we don't, the military doesn't have programs to sustain that type of equipment. We didn't try to trade it for something? or We just it's, handed it to them? It is in our benefit to help them build their capability so that their military and their security forces can sustain and that they are But these aren't all military assets. No, no, this, again, we are talking about generators, uh, housing, air conditioners, TVs, things right. like that. And before it goes to the Iraqis, we have processes that are for the United States state. And then, you know, if the state of Utah wants that, they have capability to say, we want that and we will Sign us up. <laughs> your plan. <laughs> our plan. Uh, you just have to pay the transportation back yeah. to the United States for that piece of equipment. Uh, I don't think I have the dollar value of what we have given them under what was 1202 authority, which was authorized by Congress to provide them with, again, equipment that they need to build up their military capability, again, so that we can depart and they can sustain themselves for their internal security and eventually for external security for the nation. Uh, I do have a number of pieces. Is there a way to look at the list of the assets if you say, hey, the State of Utah, if they want it, you can come get it? Um, we put that process in place, sir. It, it process in place. I mean, so, so that we, when, before we turn something over, we say, here is the list of equipment at Base X that we are turning over right. to the Iraqis. And the, there is an organization called National Association of Surplus, uh, I can't, it is NASAP that screens that, the State of Utah says, I am looking for a generator for a hospital. They say there is a generator available. Here is how you get it back, and that becomes available. We don't have time in these few minutes, but if you could help clarify both the dollar value, the assets themselves, and these programs, if they are available to states or municipalities, whatever they might be, that would be helpful. I would be happy to do that. Do you have a, is there a grand total number of the assets that we are leaving behind? So that is that number. Right. There is about 50,000 other pieces of equipment, basic military equipment, that we have provided to the Iraqis, again, under congressional authority. Do we have a dollar value of and the 50,000 pieces? I do not have the pieces. dollar value on that, but I can get the, you the dollar value on I'd that. I would appreciate that. that. For the record. And let me see if I can give you the number that we have given to the states. I do have that somewhere in my uh, records. But I will get you that as well. Take a other moment. than that, nothing else is being left behind. We are retrograding other than those type of pieces of equipment that we really don't need anymore. The process is that if it is needed in Afghanistan, it goes to Afghanistan. If it is needed somewhere else in the U.S. Central Command, it goes there. Most of the equipment there belongs to the units that we deployed there. And when they return, they carry that back with them to the United States. The logistics of this must be amazing. If you could please keep looking for that number. Let me go back to Ambassador Kennedy here. I want to talk about the, uh, the uh, $481 million, is my understanding, for the interim consular post. Um, these are interim facilities, right? They are supposed to last uh, three to five years. This would be uh, uh, in Erbil and Basra, as opposed to building more permanent type structures. I know there was a congressional funding issue here at play. The concern is that spending $481 million on what it would be an interim facility that is only going to last a few years. Um, Mr. Chairman, let me, I'll get you a, a specific breakdown okay. of that figure. We are being as minimalistic as possible. We are u reusing T walls. We are, the sites we are using, both in Basra and in Erbil and in Baghdad and in Kirkuk, are all former U.S. military troop sites. So we are using equipment that they are transferring to us on, on another one of the programs you were just asking mm -hmm. uh, my colleague about. Am I off on the number, though, the $481 million for two facilities? I, th I think that that number, that number includes things that, that, that 
artificially inflate the number. And let me give you, I will give you a piece of paper on that, sir. That, fair enough. I would appreciate that. Last thing I want to uh, discuss here is uh, uh, what is happening with uh, Iran and their, their presence there. Uh, we have had, um, had previous incidents with uh, Iranian-made uh, missiles being fired at us. What do you see happening right now? It appears as if they are just laying low, waiting for January 1st to come about, and the concern is that they are going to step these things up and start to go after our 17,000 personnel there. What is your assessment of the situation? My assessment, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, is that Iran does not wish to see a stable democratic Iraq as a linchpin of a of a new way of doing business in that part of the world, and they will go to significant extremes to disrupt our efforts to assist the government and people of Iraq to achieve the, dem the democracy. They have a fledging democracy. It is, it is building. It will take a while to build the democracy, as I think is, we know from our own, our own country. So the, it is, it is in the interest of the Iranians to disrupt our efforts, and I believe that they will continue to do so. How do we defend ourselves? Right? Basically, we are taking a, a, uh, a position that it is going to be our policy to just duck and cover without the ability and the opportunity to, to fire back. How, how capable do we think the Iraqis are going to be to actually go out and take out the threat or somebody is actually continuing to fire upon an embassy, for instance? Be because of the excellent training that, uh, and joint operations that our military has been conducting with the, uh, with the Iraqis over the last few years, I believe, and I could ask my DOD colleagues to comment, uh, I believe that the Iraqi uh, capabilities are growing significantly and continue to grow. They are they have adequate? They are, they are certainly not up to U.S. military standards, no, sir. But it, it, is, it is an effort that is on the upswing. I believe that they, they are cooperating with us. The Iraqi police are, are working with us. And I believe that we will be able to, uh, to accomplish that in, uh, over time. I, I guess I am concerned about January 1st, which isn't too far around the, the, the corner. Uh, one of these letters from Joseph McManus, uh, Acting Assistant Secretary of Legislative Affairs for the Department of State back in uh, July of 2011, in the comments said, quote, although the competency and capabilities of the ISF have improved in recent years, they are generally capable of providing internal security for Iraq. They still face specific capability gaps and continue to operate in an uncertain security environment, end quote. This is just an ongoing concern we think we can expect. the. Uh, I, I, expansion of uh, Iran's presence there to try to disrupt what's going on, and I don't know how we would defend ourselves against it. Well, I believe, I believe, uh, Mr. Chairman, that uh, that our continued cooperation with Iraqi officials, the Iraqis want to have a democracy in Iraq. They do not want to be a satellite of Iran. There is. There was a, a, a very, very bloody war that took place yep. several years ago between Iraq and Iran. So I believe that we can count on the Iraqis to pursue their own self-interest, which is to maintain a free, democratic, and stable Iraq, and we need to partner with them in that endeavor. Thank you. You are back. Thank you. Uh, Ambassador, of course, one of the tools that uh, as a diplomat, uh, you will recognize that we are not using with Iran in this situation is diplomacy. And I, I think that might have some limiting effects on our ability to try and uh, bring some order to what is going on in that part of the world and something for us all to, to consider. I won't ask you to comment on it, comment on it because you are a diplomat and I know what your, your answer will be. Uh, but certainly I think it is something that we should think about in times to have all of these people that are so well trained as diplomats and then just not use one of the tools in our arsenal on that. Uh, Mr. Estevez, can you tell me how much money the Department of Defense will no longer have to spend in Iraq once the transfer is made over to State on an annual basis? I cannot, sir. I will have to get, take that for the record. Mr. Birchfeld, Ambassador Birchfeld, do you have any information on that? I don't have the numbers in front of me, sir. We will we'll get back to you. I know Ambassador Kennedy does then, don't you? 
figures that I have seen, uh, Mr. Cherney, say that it, the difference is approximately $50 billion a year uh, by the Department of Defense versus an ex estimated $6 billion a year for the Department of State. I think that is a significant uh, shift in mission. I think it is a, a significant uh, reduction in funding. I, and I know we had discussed it before. That is why I thought these gentlemen had. I wanted to make sure they had an opportunity to say it if, it was, if they knew it was otherwise on that. Uh, this $6 billion the Department of State has, uh, are you now forced under your current budgetary situation to take that from other Department of State activities, or have you received adequate funds to plus up for that amount? Uh, Mr. Cherney, in, in the President's budget request for, uh, for, F, for fiscal year 12, the State Department budget is presented in two, two segments, a regular budget and an overseas contingency operating budget which is a parallel to what the Department of Defense has used for many years. If the President's budget request is enacted as requested, meaning both the regular budget and the contingency operating budget, we would not have to draw funds from the regular to support the contingency operations. And what Iraq. would happen if the uh, House budget, uh, as it passed the House, were the uh, effective operating vehicle? At, at an 18 to 20 percent cut to State Department operations, I literally, even though it is my responsibility to plan for contingencies, my pencil can't get there, sir. Okay. Um, but I think it is reasonable to assume that if we want to fund the $6 billion for your operation in Iraq, it is going to come from somewhere, it, which means other areas that are already uh, underfunded will be drawn down. Absolutely, sir. Okay. The, are you knowledgeable of any USAID activities that will be continuing on in Iraq? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I know that, that AID will continue, will be continue to operate in Iraq. There is, there is funding requested in the Foreign Assistance Program uh, for them. I, frankly, sir, though, am not an expert on, on the AID programs. I know that we are making provisions, my, I and my right. colleagues, for the platform on which AID will, will have a presence in Iraq. Right, that is what I was getting at. And the security for you, AID will be uh, through you or uh, directly on their own hires of? No, uh, sir. They, they, they are under, since they are under Chief of Mission Authority, their, their uh, security will be provided by the Diplomatic Security Service. Okay. And what steps have you taken in the State Department to uh, deal with the issue of debarment and suspension? And I note that. Uh, First, Kuwait couldn't get the barred when uh, there was a little doubt that it should have been. So how are we improving on that situation so contractors will at least know that there is some bite uh, when they violate? We have just, uh, working with uh, the procurement executive at the Department, we, he, he has just issued a new, a new uh, State Department procurement, uh, what is called a PIB, a Procurement Information Bulletin, that increases substantially our ability to, uh, to, to uh, follow up on the Commission on War Tank Contracting's recommendations, not in this report, but in previous ones. And we will be able to, I believe, uh, provide a greatly upgraded ability to suspend and debar under the program we have set forward. And I would be glad to send up to, you, up to you and your staff a copy of our new, uh, our new program. Thank you, Ambassador. Lastly, uh, what measures are the State taking to ensure that you are going to have adequate oversight of the log cap for when you take over the contract, and how long do you think that is going to last? Will that be your vehicle after 2012? I think it will be, it'll be a vehicle for, for more than one year. Yes, sir. We realize that this is a major activity. Someone has taken, someone took a, a quote of mine or one of my colleagues out of, uh, totally out of context, saying that the State Department does not have the resources to oversee the log cap 4 contract. That is entirely true, but there was a semicolon there. And that is why we, uh, on a reimbursable basis, have engaged the Defense Contract Audit Agency and the Defense Contract Management Agency as our partners in overseeing the log cap contract. It will be fully overseen and fully audited. We are just using uh, professionals from the Department of Defense who have the career-specific talents and abilities to do that kind of life support contract, which we don't. I would never have engaged in that route unless I had an agreement with DCMA and DCAA to provide us on a reimbursable be a detail the uh, oversight that is required. Thank you. Yield back. Thank you. Now I would recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Quigley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ambassador Kennedy, you, you just touched briefly on um, the debarment issue, but 
we have years of frustration to counter a report that promises hope as we finish our activities, and the report you just referenced to uh, Mr. Tierney. Um, so we will just use a, first, a few examples of the frustrations that we might face here. The first Kuwaiti General Trading and Contracting Company, as an example. Uh, you recall being here four years ago in 2007 before this same committee. We were talking about the construction. They were the prime contractor to build the State Department embassy in Iraq. Um, cost overruns of $144 million, um, labor abuses, and you know what we now know, uh, a kickback scheme involving hundreds of million dollars of U.S. taxpayer dollars. Um, despite all these problems, the State Department has allowed First Kuwaiti to continue to operate. Uh, around the world, including Saudi Arabia and other countries. Um, if you can't deal with that after all these years, what gives us any hope that uh, debarment, suspension will have some sort of effect because there is a new plan? I don't, I don't want to debate a specific numbers with you, sir, because I would, I'd like to sit with you and discuss them. But there were not cost overruns of, of $146 million, nor, nor, were, nor am I aware of a huge kickback scheme uh, for First Kuwaiti related to State Department activities amounting to hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, we, the, we monitored that, I will admit, in building the American Embassy in Kuwait. Uh, the then Director of Overseas Buildings used a construction oversight model which did not deliver everything that, uh, that I would have wanted if I had been the Under Secretary at that time. That model has, has been changed. On your point about the State Department outside of the contract in Baghdad has never awarded a contract to, to First Kuwaiti. The, the references you made to Saudi Arabia and also one in Indonesia were awarded to an American company registered operating in the State of Maryland uh, named Grunley Walsh. They subsequently sold to another American company called Aurora, who utilized First Kuwaiti as a subsidiary of, of theirs. But our contract well, and under doesn't the that law, seem as an obvious way to get around? Uh, I'm not a lawyer. I mean, the fact that they can actually use them anyway, it, 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 the, you, you know, it's semantics that you're, well, what you're getting I'm, into at this point. Saying, well, we didn't actually do it, somebody else did. Well, the fact no. that they're allowed to gets to no. the point. And I'd love to have the private debate that you encourage about the problems that existed with First Kuwaiti. I would, I would be glad to call off on you, sir, and I will, I will seek an appointment. But I do believe we have no plans to use First Kuwaiti ever again. The problems that arose in Baghdad were, in effect, in effect almost parallel to the, the awarding of the original contracts for, for Surabaya and for Jeddah. And the problems were unearthed along the way, and the contract was already in place with the American company. And we have, we have put additional monitoring personnel on those, and because of the potential cost to the American taxpayer of stopping a contract in the middle and breaking it and then trying to restart it, we have been moving very, very explicitly. The contract in Jeddah, in fact, is suspended. There is no work. I have halted work on that in first so were there, well, And they are 99 percent complete. Were there problems or not? I mean, why would you think about stopping a contract in the, in the middle if there weren't any problems? What I were the problems? We, the problems came out in, in, in Baghdad and in, and in Surabaya and Jiddah, in effect, simultaneously. What, in, in, what were the problems? If, if I had problems, it all wrong, what were the problems poor, more specific? Poor, poor management on, on site, on scene. But what, so the poor management created what problems? T time delays and work that, that op we have State Department construction engineers and architects on site, as I think in the, in the buildings trade is called the owner's representative, on scene in Jeddah and in Surabaya. The, those representatives were constantly requiring work to be stopped and work to be redone at the contractor's expense. 
not at ours, because, and that is the poor performance leading to seeing a product that was not headed in the direction that we wanted, and that is why we have representatives on site who can tell the contractor that wiring, that wall is not built according to the specifications in the contract and the bid documents. You tear it out. You get no additional funds for correcting your errors. Just, I have run out of time, but can you quickly tell us how many contractors has the State Department suspended or, de or debarred in Iraq? Suspended or debarred in Iraq? Uh, I, I don't I don't have that number at the tip of my tongue. I will get that for you. Could you get it to the full committee? Absolutely, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We'll address Chairman. it to the Chairman. Well, thank you. Gentleman yields back. We recognize Mr. Tierney. Thank you. Um, Ambassador Kennedy, have you taken advantage of the good offices of the Special Inspector General for Iraq uh, or the General Accountability Office or both uh, at the outset here of your, of your venture for what advice and counsel they may give you and lessons learned on past contracting situations? Uh, Yes, sir. The, the Special Inspector General for, for Iraq, the, uh, the uh, General Accountability Office, the State Department's Inspector General have been engaged in an incredible number of inspections and oversights. I have long lists that I won't bother to read off to you, all the, all the work that they are doing. There are multiple uh, audits and inspections going on, I believe, two of them as, as we speak. So we, that is the one. I, the other is using them for advice and counsel as you start up. We, you know. What we do is we read every single one of their reports and use, the, and use those as lessons learned for the future. But you haven't engaged directly with them uh, at any point in time? They, they, the inspectors general do not like to give, to give advice because if they give advice, they are then, it is in effect, they feel it is a pass they have given me. I, I, I would say, you have told me to do X. I did X. It didn't didn't work. You can't. Well, I, that's interesting. So we use. I had a different impression from talking to folks over there, but uh, if I understand that aspect of it. But yes. I do think it's important to get glean all the lessons learned that we can. I, I read every single one of the reports that they that they have done on the uh, the platform that I am built and that I have built. My predecessor to build, and we plan to continue, sir. Thank you. I have one last question, then I would give you each an opportunity to kind of cite your biggest concern moving forward. But before we get to that, um, I am still concerned about the capability for, you know, medical-type situations, only six beds uh, overnight. Does the State Department have a, a plan for evacuation, should that need to occur? And we are talking about 17,000 people here. How, how, do, how do you address that? We, we have been working with the Department of Defense and with our embassies in Amman and Baghdad on, on mass casualty scenarios using both our assets and assets that we might be able to call upon from DOD. There is such a, there is such a plan being developed. I might, I might point out, sir, the, the number is, is not 17,000. It is much closer to 16,000. And uh, I believe that the actually, I feel so much better. Well. And, and if you take just the State Department component there, it is it's, uh, it's, it's actually closer to maybe 10,000 plus the, my Department of Defense colleagues. So the numbers, numbers are all When you correct. say 10,000, 10,000 what? 10,000, uh, uh, 10,000 about, I would say, closer to, to yeah, 10,000, 11,000 State Department uh, Government employees and and contractor support, and then there is, as as my colleagues at Defense referred to, the uh, Office of Security Co Cooperation, which is part of the Chief of Mission's responsibilities. But they have their they have their own personnel. As we move forward, I, th I would it would it be reasonable at the end of the by the end of the month. Could you provide me a specific number then, and how that breaks down, if it, so there is yeah. no confusion moving forward? We're, yeah, we we will. I mean, today, if I towed up everything, the answer for for state and OSCI is uh, sixteen thousand zero zero nine zero zero nine. Very we, good. We track this very very closely because we have no intention of overbuilding, and I do not wish to underbuild either. Good. Thank you. I want to. I mean, we start with Mr. Estevez. I just want to wrap up here. We want to. We need to be brief. But 
your biggest concern moving forward, the thing that we have to achieve and tackle by the, uh, by the end of the year? Well, under the current scenario of drawing down to zero, aside from the OSCI presence in Iraq, it's a massive logistical move, uh, 43,000 folks in about two and a half months, uh, about 800,000 pieces of equipment to come out, actually more close to 850,000. Uh, so from a standpoint of logistics, it's a phenomenal piece of work. Now, we've done that. We've been doing this uh, over the last two years, really, uh, drawdown. We're confident we can do it, but there's always hitches in these type of uh, operations. Should there be uh, successful negotiations, uh, turning some of that around is also complicated, uh, but absolutely executable. Thank you. Ambassador Virchow. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I think that uh, from a policy point of view, uh, between now and the end of the year, we, we do hope that we can come to an agreement with the Iraqis uh, on the full dimensions of a long-term security relationship uh, with that country that meets their needs and which also serves our long-term strategic interests. Uh, I think that the long-term success of Iraq's efforts to consolidate its sovereignty, its democracy, its stability uh, has become even more important in the wake of the uh, Arab Spring. Uh, the Iraqis face many threats, some internal, some external. I share your concern, Mr. Chairman, about uh, Iran. And uh, as uh, Ambassador Kennedy said, they don't necessarily have an interest in, in, in stability in Iraq or in, in seeing Iraq become a sovereign state uh, that de determines its own destiny. And indeed, the Iranian-backed militias are likely to continue to pose a threat to security. That makes it all the more important that we develop a strong and robust security partnership with the Iraqis that helps them improve their abilities, which have improved significantly since uh, we, we basically handed over main pr uh, principal responsibility to them uh, more than a year ago. Uh, but they, they recognize that they need additional support go going forward, and uh, I think it is in our strategic interest to develop a relationship that meets their needs uh, so that we can help them counter these threats and uh, become a, a uh, an anchor of stability in a, in a turbulent and fast-changing uh, Middle East. Thank you. Ambassador Kennedy. Um, Mr. Chairman, when, when we started this, this transition progress, process, my, uh, my great fear that we w was that we would not be mission capable to take over the responsibilities uh, given to the Secretary of State under this new system. I believe that today we are mission capable. The remaining task is to complete the physical plant build-out. We have the aviation in place. We have the security personnel in place. We have the logistics in place. We have the life support in place. All our building projects are underway. There have been the normal delays operating in a war zone from delays getting steel into the country to the U.S. military. We thinking the U.S. military would be off site X and on day one, and they were off on day 27. And that is not pointing at them in any way. They have been absolutely fabulous in their cooperation. We could not have asked for anything more. But we are, we are now mission capable, but I still have to complete internal and some external build-out of facilities within our compounds. Very good. Thank you all for your, your commitment to, to, our, to our nation and our country, and uh, the hard work and dedication, your patriotism. Appreciate the staff that does uh, so much of the work here and helping us uh, along the way. I thank uh, Mr. Tierney and uh, appreciate that if there's additional updates uh, that you feel sufficient or need to be brought before the committee, we'd certainly appreciate that. Committee now stands adjourned.